Good afternoon. We have questions on infrastructure investment in cities. Question number one, Richard Simpson. Um, to, to ask the Scottish Government what additional support will be provided to cities such as Stirling in order to ensure that adequate infrastructure is in place for the year of the homecoming. Cabinet Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. Scotland already has an impressive track record of delivering highly successful major events, including homes, Homecoming Scotland 2009, building in this the Scottish Government and partners on the Homecoming Scotland 2014 strategic group, including Visit Scotland and the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, are working together to help ensure that the appropriate infrastructure is in place to support the inspirational programme of events and activities taking place in cities, towns and villages across Scotland throughout the year. Richard Simpson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The First Minister launching the events programme for Homecoming 2014 today stated that uh, Stirling would be one of the epicentres for the Homecoming, with events like the celebration of the 700th anniversary of Bannockburn uh, and the uh, the, the city acting as a transport hub for the Ryder Cup, each event involving some 50,000 visitors. Will the Cabinet Secretary undertake to ensure that the necessary upgrading to local infrastructure is, is funded by the Government, and will she undertake to have an early meeting with the Council leaders to plan for the success of these events? Cabinet Secretary? Well, I think the First Minister is absolutely right to point to the central role of Stirling in the 2014 celebrations, the year of homecoming, the 700th anniversary of the Battle of Bannockburn being uh, two of the obvious events. Uh, the Scottish Government is uh, working hard with partners to ensure that these events are the success that all of us want them to be, and I would be happy, uh, as with the Transport Minister, uh, to have discussions uh, with Stirling Council and indeed with other uh, councils about how we prepare properly uh, for these events, which I, I know we all hope are a roaring success. Crawford. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that some of the infrastructure that is already in place through fantastic expenditure both from the Government and from organisations like Historic Scotland to create the fantastic new James V Palace at the Castle or the, or the expenditure to upgrade the Bannockburn site is a fantastic uh, investment. Together with the money that is going in, I understand about £250,000 from Creative Scotland to help the National Trust of Scotland. Um, do a fantastic event on the Bannockburn field is in stark contrast, actually, to the problems being created by Stirling Council, led by the Tories and Labour, who have now cut expenditure for 22 cultural organisations at the same time as we are dealing with the 2014 celebrations. Cabinet Secretary. Well, obviously local budgets are a, a matter for individual local authorities, but I do know the fact that uh, Stirling Council is making cuts to culture projects in the run-up to 2014, and I would hope that all councils uh, would ensure that the decisions they are taking um, are in line with the ambitions we all have for success of uh, the events that we will celebrate in 2014. As the, men, uh, the member rightly says, uh, the Scottish Government has invested heavily in infrastructure, as heavily as we possibly can, given the uh, reductions from Westminster to our capital budget, but including in that investment is some very important investment in the cultural infrastructure of Scotland. Uh, Bruce Crawford mentions the James V Palace uh, at Stirling Castle, a fantastic example of that uh, kind of collaborative investment um, and one that I'm sure we'll see uh, visitors flock to it in 2014 and in other years. Margaret Fraser. Uh, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary uh, should be aware there is some concern in the Stirling area about potential traffic congestion in and around the uh, Bannockburn site in, in, in relation to the uh, 700th anniversary event due to the lack of parking facilities in the area. Uh, what plans are there for park and ride facilities to be supported uh, by the Scottish Government to avoid the disruption to local residents? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are substantial uh, plans in place to ensure that uh, we can cope with uh, the influx of visitors that we all hope there will be to areas like Stirling, which is a, a thoroughly good thing. I know uh, how enthusiastic Murdo Fraser is about the 700th anniversary of Bannockburn uh, celebrations. Uh, the Transport Minister, uh, I know, would be happy to write to the member and indeed to other members to uh, set out in more detail some of the specific park and ride uh, plans that there are uh, in Stirling and other areas where that will be necessary. Question to, Bob Doris. to ask the Scottish Government to provide an update on the progress to retender the franchise to operate rail passenger services in Scotland. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the retendering of the franchise to operate rail passenger services in Scotland is proceeding according to the arrangements laid out before the Parliament on the 6th of December 2012. Uh, the retendering will begin in summer 2013 for a handover at the end of 2014-15 financial year on the 31st of March 2015. Bob Doris. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can I draw the Minister's attention to the lack of a Sunday service on the, Mary Hill, the Glasgow Mary Hill Line, a service which, if introduced, would be of significant benefit to the constituents that I serve? Can I ask the Minister 
What provisions can be placed in any tender document to enhance such services? And will he look specifically at the case for a Sunday service on the Maryhill line? Minister. The retendering process for the Scotrail franchise will require bidders to demonstrate uh, adaptations that they will make to timetables to accommodate variations in demand, such as the one that Bob Doris mentions, and also ones as a result of seasonal variations in passenger numbers, public holidays, special events such as Christmas and the New Year period. And I am sure that those who are interested in bidding for that franchise will listen quite closely to any representations that Bob Doris wants to make to them. Richard Baker. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister said previously he would welcome a bid from a neutral or, non -for or not for profit organisation in the tendering process for the franchise. Why then is he ruled out in an answer to me today civil servants being seconded to work on such a bid, as this would be the only way to create a level playing field with the private companies bidding who will have scores of staff employed in their bid teams? Minister. I think Richard Baker's question betrays an appalling lack of knowledge about the bidding process. The idea we would second civil servants to help with a particular bid in a competitive process is just nonsensical. It is the case, of course, it's possible for a, a mutual or a, a public, -related set, a public sector-related organisation to be involved in the bidding process. We've asked specifically the Westminster Government whether we could have a public sector bid. We've been told that's not possible. It's a question that's been asked a number of times in the past. It is possible if somebody wants to get together a bid, and we've made this plain before, and they can demonstrate experience of running railways, a prerequisite laid down by the UK Government, for them to then make a bid. But the idea that we could second civil servants to help with that bid is a non-starter. Question 3, Joe McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to improve road and rail journey times from Dumfries to Glasgow and Edinburgh. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the Government recognises the importance, uh, importance of efficient and effective transport links to deliver sustainable economic growth. And since 2007, we have invested over £1.2 billion in improving the trunk road network in the south west of Scotland. Uh, these enhancements have improved journey time reliability, safety, and also delivered further overtaking opportunities, which obviously alleviates frustration. We have also delivered incremental improvements to rail services from Dumfries, which have provided enhanced commuting opportunities, improved connections and reduced journey times. Joe McAlpine. I thank the Minister for his answer. I am aware of the considerable indeed, record investment uh, in uh, the South West Road Network, and particularly the A75 road by this Government, uh, but uh, Dumfries is the South West capital and it is badly served by slow train services to the Central Bell and the A701 road, which is an accident black spot. Can you tell me what more the Government can do to address this situation in the future? Minister. On the one hand, as part of the next uh, ScotRail franchise, we will require bidders, as I have mentioned, to outline their fleet and deployment strategies to deliver both new and specified services across the network. And I will be expecting bidders to demonstrate how they will improve the comfort and suitability of trains which operate on longer distance routes. In relation to road safety, it is, of course, of paramount importance to this Government. The accident rate for the section of the A701 between Beatick and Dumfries is lower than the national average. In 2011, for example, we invested a further £75,000 in the route to improve safety at Amersfield on the A701, and that investment included the installation of vehicle-activated chevrons around the challenging bend. We obviously keep these issues under review and will continue to invest in that part of the country to achieve improvements in road safety and accessibility. Aline Murray. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, we would all appreciate faster road journey times between Dumfries and Glasgow, but I'm sure the Minister will agree that speed limits should be observed uh, while undertaking the journey. But in terms of the rail journey times, is the Minister aware that although Thornhill is on the Nith Valley line, uh, residents have to travel 14 miles south to Dumfries or 13 miles north to Sanka to catch a train. Can he therefore advise what progress is being made with distributing the stations fund uh, and what community support he would expect to be demonstrated for a bid for reopening Thornhill station to be successful? Minister. Uh, President Officer, I said on a number of occasions that the Stations Fund itself will start uh, in April next year, although it is possible for people to put together bids at the present time. Uh, and the members asked about what process and what support would be required for that. Again, it would be the support of a local authority or the regional transport partnership. They should really be involved at the early stages, making sure that that is the preferred option, that is the most efficient uh, option for that area. So uh, there is no reason why those uh, bodies, the regional transport partnership and the council, can't get together at this stage, work with local people and put together a bid, but as I say, the actual dispersal of funds will take place from April next year. Question number four, Aileen McLeod. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made on the delivery of next-generation broadband for the South of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. 
The delivery of next generation broadband in the south of Scotland has been progressed through the rest of Scotland procurement exercise, which is part of the Scottish Government's Step Change 2015 programme. The tender process for the rest of Scotland uh, commenced in September last year. This was followed by a detailed supplier engagement process and an invitation to tender issued in January 2013. The project remains on track to meet the commitment to award the final contract by the end of June this year. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there are communities across the south of Scotland, and in particular the Prince of Galloway, that do not have access to broadband at all yet. So can I therefore ask, how will these communities benefit from the rollout of next generation broadband? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Aileen MacLeod, who I know has taken a very close interest in this issue, that I absolutely understand the frustration that people feel when they do have inadequate access uh, to broadband. That's why uh, the Step Change programme is so important. Uh, when we take the Rest of Scotland programme uh, matched with the Highlands and Islands programme, the contract track for which was signed uh, yesterday, we have a, a £240 million uh, package of public sector uh, funding. Uh, this will help us towards our aim of delivering world-class digital access to all of Scotland by 2020, with that very important interim milestone of having infrastructure that will have the capacity to deliver next-generation broadband to 85 to 90 per cent of premises by 2015. And clearly, uh, the constituents that Ailey MacLeod are talking about are going to benefit substantially uh, from that. There will still be a small number of people who don't uh, have the access we want them to have, but we are continuing to work uh, often in innovative ways to look at extending that access further. But there is no doubt uh, that the Step Change programme will deliver just that, a step change in access to next generation broadband technology. Question number five, George Adam. To ask the Scottish Government how successful this year's Scottish Communities League Cup has been at promoting the values of respect, responsibility and tolerance. Cabinet Secretary. It's been a great success. Our sponsorship of the Scottish Communities League Cup is a commitment to build on what is good about the game, to take the passion from uh, grassroots and communities and provide a pos positive message to the rest of football and indeed society. We've been working in partnership with the SFL, SPL, Scottish FA and clubs themselves uh, to engage with communities and educate young people to understand the three pillars of the Cup, respect, responsibility and tolerance. George Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. As the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, the famous Paisley St Murren recently won the Scottish Communities League Cup. And will the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that on the day St Murren and Hearts fans did indeed promote the values of the tournament and note the amount of community involvement St Murren has sustained for so many years, including the run-up and after the game over the years. And Paisley, we are lucky to have such a great community-based club. Does the Minister agree with me? that sports clubs like St Murn engaging with their communities like this can only be positive for their local communities. Mr Adam, you couldn't help yourself, Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> as, as someone who supports another team uh, that plays in black and white, um, can I say, firstly, that I'm, I'm sure uh, George Adams' shirt-tie combination is completely coincidental in terms of the colours uh, he's wearing, but can I also take the opportunity, uh, as I'm sure the First Minister would want uh, to do, to congratulate St Mirren Football Club on what was indeed a, a famous uh, victory in the Cup final. Um, I agree with uh, the rest of George Adams' question. Our national game is a powerful means of engaging with young people, uh, and the sponsorship that we have uh, seen has been an ideal way to build uh, and all of the excellent work that clubs are doing uh, to help place football clubs back in the heart of, of communities. Indeed, of, in recognition of the important role St Mirren and other clubs play in communities, our £1.8 million sponsorship package this year includes a community engagement fund of up to uh, £500,000 to help all 42 clubs develop their community programmes. Um, I know the Minister for uh, Sport was impressed in a recent visit to see two clubs' community activities at Motherwell and Airdrie United. Uh, she has plans to visit more clubs in the coming uh, months uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, she would agree uh, that a visit to uh, the Communities League Cup winners uh, would seem like a, an ideal opportunity to see their work in action. Bruce Crawford. President Officer, on the matter of black and white, I hope the Chamber would agree with me that we hope we can save the famous pars who play at East End Park. And I'll be going along to the game tonight to watch them playing Falkirk and Emdale. If she wants to join me, please feel free to do so. And I hope the Deputy First Minister will agree that the, it's be great if Dunfermline Athletic came through their current difficulties in a successful way. Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, as somebody who has uh, nephews uh, in Dunfermline who support that team who play in black and white, can I uh, say in all, all seriousness, I think uh, everybody in the Chamber uh, will uh, understand the severity of the situation that faces Dunfermline Athletic Football Club just now, and I would echo uh, the comments of, of Bruce Crawford. I'm sure all fans of that club will get behind it, and we all wish it every success as it uh, tries to pull through its current difficulties. Question number six, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to ensure that the fares and public transport do not become so expensive that people are priced back into their cars. Minister Keith Brown. Yeah, the Scottish Government provides substantial funding for rail and bus services in Scotland, including subsidies to make public transport an attractive alternative to the private car. In the coming year, we will offer £187 million in national concessionary travel reimbursement to ensure free bus travel to people over 60 or with disabilities, £50 million in bus service operators grant, which helps keep fares lower than it would otherwise be, and within our £5 billion package of improvements for the rail network, we support almost 75 per cent of the cost of a rail ticket through government subsidies. John Finney. I thank the Minister for that reply. State-run East Coast has been widely regarded as a success with more than £600 million in premiums and profits paid into the UK government coffers in the last three years. Would the Minister agree with me that a state-run service can be a success? Will he make representations to the UK government not to return East Coast to the profiteers of the City of London? And will he outline what plans he has to return Scotland's rail network to successful public ownership? Minister. I think part of the uh, answer to the question uh, to John Finney lies in the response I gave to Richard Baker, which is that we are prohibited from doing that. We have asked the UK government about that. It is, of course, something of an anomaly that a state-owned organisation in Germany can bid for the public rail services in Scotland, and yet we can't have a public sector bid uh, in Scotland under the current situation. It's also very surprising to me not to have been contacted by the UK government on the question of the East Coast Main Line. For my part, I'm very surprised they should see this as a priority, given the state of the franchising process for other franchises, and I will be taking that matter up with the UK government. Question 7, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities last met Hub North Scotland Limited and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. I have not met with Hub North Scotland Limited directly, but officials regularly brief me on hub developments. Hubco North is making good progress with regard to delivering new infrastructure projects for the public sector. Tavis Scott. I'm, I'm grateful for the Cabinet Secretary's reply. In that briefing that she has received, is she aware that the new Anson High School in Lerwick is to be built by the Tier 1 bidder uh, Millers, and yet the a local consortia of three uh, Shetland building businesses who offered to form that consortia were not allowed to bid. Will she look into why that happened and give me an explanation as to why taxpayers uh, and value for money weren't helped by having a, bro a broader tender? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm more than happy to write uh, to Daphne Scott with uh, the full background uh, to uh, the question he asks and, and giving him the detail he requests. Um, I am aware of the situation uh, around Anderson High School. Uh, I'm also aware of, uh, for example, some of the uh, community uh, benefits that are uh, envisaged to be uh, achieved uh, through the project, for example, targets around uh, one apprentice, one graduate trainee per £6 million of capital expenditure. Uh, I'm also aware uh, of the plans uh, that Hubco uh, North have to hold industry days, meet the buyer events, to engage locally with SMEs uh, who may be interested in getting involved with these projects uh, and uh, their commitment to work uh, with companies who have the required skills, experiences and uh, resources. It is anticipated that local companies will come forward and demonstrate that they do have the required experience and skills and are able to compete for the work that is available. And I'm sure uh, Tavish Scott would agree with me uh, that that would be a desirable outcome in order that we can both get uh, the fantastic new facility uh, for, the, for, for Shetland, but also ensure that the economic impact of constructing that new facility is felt uh, in the local community as well. Question number eight, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made towards introducing Wi-Fi on all Caledonia McBrain ferries serving the inner and outer Hebrides. Minister Keith Brown. Hey, Calmark Ferries Limited have undertaken a number of trials of several Wi-Fi delivery methods, including satellite, point-to-point -point wireless and 3G. Hey, Calmark hoped to tender and introduce a new service model during 2013, and they have now started on the formal procurement process for the introduction of Wi-Fi on all their ferries that serve the Clyde and the Inner and Outer Hebrides. 
Angus MacDonald. As a regular user of uh, CalMac ferries, I appreciate the progress being made. However, uh, the Minister will be aware that CalMac are trailing behind Northlink uh, in the introduction of Wi-Fi on their vessels. Uh, with the loss in productivity associated with the lack of Wi-Fi on long and short sea crossings, what can the Minister do to ensure early introduction of Wi-Fi on CalMac ferries sooner rather than later? Minister. Uh, I would, first of all, point, I suppose, to the, the difference in scale that uh, CalMac face as opposed to Northlink uh, ferries in terms of the number of routes which they currently serve. Uh, but I am uh, in agreement with the member that uh, I am convinced of the benefits of Wi-Fi to ferry users who want to make the best use of their business and leisure time on board CalMac ferries. As I have said, a full business case is in the process of being prepared uh, by CalMac. Uh, as well as uh, myself keeping in touch with CalMac on this issue, I can tell the member that Castle Bay High School in Barra were uh, one of the instigators here. They wrote to CalMac in a petition, and I've done an awful lot of work to make sure that the Lord of the Isles and other vessels are uh, converted to taking Wi-Fi as quickly as possible. So progress is being made, and as I say, the, the intention of CalMac is to have these systems implemented this year. We now move to question on culture and external affairs. Question number one, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what steps is taken to directly promote, sustain and develop the unique culture of the Highlands and Islands. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the, Scottish, the Scottish Government is a strong supporter of the unique culture of the Highlands and Islands. Along with our national agencies and other partners, we have been working to sustain and celebrate the heritage and cultural life of the Highlands and Islands and promote the area. We are particularly keen to support our Gaelic heritage, which is why Creative Scotland provide regular funding to Fesh Ross to support their, their important work in this area. And this year, as we celebrate the Year of Natural Scotland, it is a further opportunity for us to spotlight, celebrate and promote the outstanding natural beauty and landscapes of the region to our people and our visitors. And the programme for the year comprises more than 40 potential flagship events, including the Heb Celt Festival in the Western Isles. In addition, Creative Scotland have provided over £100,000 as part of the Year of Natural Scotland Open Fund to support cultural projects in the Highlands and Islands. And, of course, Historic Scotland is investing in a major representation repre of Iona Abbey, 1,450 years since St Columbus first settled on Iona. Rhoda Grant. The Minister will be aware that Murray Council have cut their arts funding by 100%. This will mean the closure of more than seven libraries, the loss of an arts development officer, withdrawal of funding to museums, and will impact on the viability of 33 eh, local arts groups in Murray. What discussions have the Scottish Government had with Murray Council to mitigate those swinging cuts, and what is the Council's statutory responsibility to the arts? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, on the latter point, the only statutory responsibility is in uh, relation to libraries, uh, as you may well know. Uh, it's deeply disappointing that Murray Council have taken that step. It is in contrast to many other local authorities, and indeed only last week I visited East Ayrshire Council, which uh, really embraces culture in every aspect of its life. And I think Murray Council would do well to learn from the experience of East Ayrshire Council, uh, which has taken a different tack than Murray Council. Uh, the Murray Council is an autonomous body, as she well knows. In terms of local government finance, uh, a flat cash, uh, broadly flat, uh, flat cash settlement was provided for local authorities. But I think it's quite clear that across Scotland, many local authorities are doing what East Ayrshire is doing. Uh, and indeed, in terms of the Scottish Government, we've worked very hard to protect local, uh, local government spend and indeed cultural spend. And I think it's deeply disappointing that the councillors in Murray have done otherwise. Uh, I hope they might revisit um, their uh, decision. But at the end of the day, as I have reported to the Culture Committee in this Parliament, uh, national government cannot be a last stop uh, funder of last resort for decisions made by autonomous local authorities, and they will have to face their own electorate in that regard. Stuart Stevenson. In addition to the cuts that Rhoda Grant uh, talked about in Murray, I understand that the number of principal teachers is likely to be cut. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that a cultural appreciation starts in schools and it's very much to be regretted if the independent Tory-led Council in Murray were to make those cuts as well? Cabinet Secretary. 
quite clearly, um, education and culture go hand in hand, and in terms of uh, the provision we as a government have provided for, in terms of um, the uh, creative education toolkit that we've provided. But can I reiterate the importance of music and drama and arts in our education system? Only last night I attended a fantastic performance at uh, my own um, local school, and Lithgow Academy, the Spring Concert, which saw hundreds of youngsters performing, uh, celebrating their creativity and their arts and their culture. Uh, I do think that uh, tribute should pay, be paid to the principal teacher um, of music, particularly in that school, but also I think to all the teachers across Scotland that keep alive that burning spirit and enthusiasm for arts and culture. Question number two, in the name of Alex Ferguson, has not been lodged for understandable reasons because he was on Parliament Business in Malawi at the time. Question number three, Alison McInnes. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage more women to enter the computer games industry. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, computer games is a subsector of the creative industries, one of the seven growth sectors of our economic strategy. We are currently working with our partner organisations reviewing our approach to developing support for the creative industry sector. This includes the development of a skills investment plan led by Skills Development Scotland. And we would expect the skills investment plan to address the results of the BAFTA careers past service survey published in November 2012 which identified clear gender issues in the industry and the skills investment plan development process will also help to support and encourage new recruits and develop skills in the sector. Alison McInnes. I thank the Minister for that, that response and I'm interested to hear of that update. Computer game technology is worth around 30 million to our economy and the expanding industry is young and dynamic and of course it's got a strong presence in Dundee. But Aberdeen University has only 18% of its female, uh, students um, studying games related um, courses. There, only 18% of them are female and the full potential of the industry will surely be better realised if it can draw on a diverse workforce. So um, can I urge the, the, the Minister to ask Scottish Enterprise, uh, Skills Development Scotland and the universities to work together to really develop that action plan? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I hope from my previous answer I have given her reassurances as part of the, the skills investment uh, development process that, was, that is taking place. But also uh, it is important that we encourage more young women into science and engineering and including computing science at schools in order that they're in the position to be encouraged to go into the gaming industry itself. Decisions about uh, career courses uh, at Aperture University will be made while young women are at school. So I think the work that Angela Constance as our employment minister is taking forward in regard to career-wise and the STEM support she's providing for young women there and the announcement of a quarter of a million pounds to encourage girls to consider career careers in science, including computing science and engineering, I hope will, will be assistance in this regard. Question number four, Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the call from the National Union of Journalists for a moratorium on job cuts at BBC Scotland uh, and its decision to bring forward redundancies before the end of the financial year. Cabinet Secretary. Ever since the BBC published its proposals for handling its reduced budget as a result of the licence fee settlement negotiated behind closed door over 48 hours by the UK Government, the Scottish Government has consistently stood up for the BBC jobs in Scotland and for high quality news and current affairs coverage by BBC Scotland. The First Minister and myself have repeatedly expressed our concerns over budget decisions, job losses and the potential impact on quality to the Director of BBC Scotland, the Chair of the BBC Trust and respective Directors General of the BBC. Only last week, on the 18th of March, I met with the Deputy Chair of the BBC Trust, Diane Coyle, and the BBC Trust Member for Scotland, Bill Matthews, and once more reiterated my concerns. I am very pleased to learn that some progress has been made in regard to protecting jobs at BBC Scotland with the NUJ uh, announcing on the 30, Thursday, the 21st of March, that they had reached an agreement with BBC Scotland management to delay the termination date into April uh, for at-risk staff. So I'm pleased that the BBC and the NUJ have reached this interim agreement. We would strongly urge both parties to continue their discussions and reach a constructive resolution. Alex Johnson. I ask the Minister if the Government will be taking the same constructive approach and engaged approach with the Scotsman publications. Excuse me, Mr Johnson. Losses. I'll take your question in a minute. I've just been pointed out that Mr Gob uh, Gibson didn't get a supplementary. Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. I'm aware of and I welcome the delay in applying redundancies at the BBC, but deplore the excessive frontline staff cuts uh, by a BBC Scotland management which displays 
a macho approach to ordering redundancies ahead of any other BBC region or nation? What assurances can the Scottish Government get that full coverage of news in my area in the Highlands and other areas of Scotland will not be shrunk below current levels? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I, I've already said, I have repeatedly, and indeed the First Minister has repeatedly uh, requested assurances from the BBC in terms of coverage, particularly quality in news and current affairs, and that should apply to all parts of Scotland. And I'm very conscious of the sheer geographical size of the Highlands and Islands and the importance of providing that uh, coverage. Now, clearly the BBC had a licence fee freeze, uh, freeze imposed on it by the UK Government, but there is no escaping the fact that the BBC Scotland made a choice to front load their cuts in the first year of the new licence fee period. At this very important uh, period of time in Scotland's history, it's very important that we get the quality of news coverage that the people of Scotland deserve, and that should bear very heavily, I think, on the BBC management's decisions. Mr Johnson. Can I refer the Minister to the question I asked some moments ago uh, with regard to the Government's attitude to a similar problem at Scotsman Publications? Yeah. It is important that we have quality news and current affairs uh, covered in whatever media. It is disappointing that across media in Scotland at this very important time in Scotland's history um, that job losses are being announced. I think it is very important that we work with different publications. I am very uh, conscious of the independence of newspapers. They are very clear in stating that to us. Uh, but in that regard, I have got very deep concerns and I think the announcements are very disappointing. Question number five, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to promote the use of new fair trade products in Scotland. Minister, how the use? The Scottish Government fund the Scottish Fair Trade Forum, an independent body whose role it is to promote fair trade products in Scotland. On the 25th of February, at the start of Fair Trade Fortnight, I had the pleasure of announcing that Scotland had achieved fair trade nation status. Achieving that status, of course, uh, raises awareness of fair trade products. On the same day, I also launched the Fair Trade Football Initiative. This worthwhile project aims to supply fair trade footballs to youth and sports groups in disadvantaged areas across Scotland. In addition, the Scottish Government continues to lead by example by specifying the provision of fair trade options in our catering services framework contract, and we have issued guidance on how fair and ethical trading can be supported through public procurement to the wider public sector. Neil Bibby. Um, can I thank the Minister for that answer and, and welcome his comments about the fair trade football campaign? Um, it's estimated that 70% of the world's footballs are hand-stitched by child labour in one town in Pakistan. I'm sure we would all agree that is a shocking statistic. Uh, the first challenge is to improve awareness of fair trade footballs, particularly among young people. Um, so could I ask the Minister to tell me what action he will consider uh, the Scottish Government intends to take to encourage the use of fair trade footballs in our schools? Minister. I thank Neil Bibby for the question. Let me also put on record uh, the, the work, and I note the work that he did over fair trade fortnight, uh, in his own area in terms of raising uh, this initiative and the Fair Trade Football Initiative. Uh, I will certainly write to him with some of the detail uh, of what we are planning to do, not just within schools but also within youth groups. Uh, and I would be more than happy, of course, to meet with the member to discuss that because it is not just about schools, but it is about getting in those organisations. Uh, and I think the Commonwealth Games in 2014 also gives us an extra push and we have to drive ourselves to make sure that we are using fair trade products, uh, be they footballs or, or others. But I am more than happy to, to meet with them. And as I say, I put on record uh, certainly the, the efforts that he made in his local area in terms of the football tournament. Uh, uh, he might have been reticent to mention that because I, I noticed he didn't win the cup. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I welcome his, uh, his initiative. And more initiatives like that uh, across Scotland can only be a positive thing. Question number six, in the name of Adam Ingram, has not been lodged. The member has provided me with an explanation. Question number seven, Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to promote filmmaking in Scotland. Secretary. Uh, Creative Scotland has lead responsibility per, to promote filmmaking in Scotland. Uh, Creative Scotland administers a fund for film and broadcasting and it has allocated funding to Film City Glasgow to examine the feasibility of a film studio project with substantial funds earmarked for further development opportunities. Additionally, Creative Scotland is working with Scottish Enterprise to explore film studio projects. Last year, the First Minister hosted a film investors evening to attract further inward investment into film and the Scottish Government also provides funding to the Edinburgh International Film Festival through the Expo Fund. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. Edinburgh attracts many international productions whose benefits are realised across the whole of Scotland, but this business is dependent on local expertise and a healthy film culture. Edinburgh's ill-fated Marketing Edinburgh has decided to reduce Edinburgh film focus to a single film officer to the dismay of producers across the country. 
What steps will the Cabinet Secretary take with national filmmaking interests to ensure that filmmaking in Edinburgh and its outlying districts are protected and enhanced? Cabinet Secretary? Uh, clearly, this is a, a matter for the City of Edinburgh Council. I do have concerns about their announcement. I do think it is short-sighted. I think it sends out the wrong signals. And in terms of revenue that can be made from filmmaking, I would encourage the City of Edinburgh Council and uh, Marketing Edinburgh to take up the offer for discussions with Creative Scotland on the issue to see if there's a way forward. Question number eight, Patricia Ferguson to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Creative Scotland concerning film and television production. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is in regular contact with Creative Scotland over a range of activities, including film and television production. On Thursday, the 21st of March, I attended a Creative Scotland board meeting where film and television issues were discussed. At that meeting, I was briefed on Creative Scotland's recently commenced film review. I also met with Scottish Enterprise last week on the creative industries where opportunities for film were discussed. Patricia Ferguson, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that update, and that does indeed seem uh, to be progress. I would, however, ask the Cabinet Secretary if she can perhaps explain to the Chamber how cooperation with Scottish Enterprise is being taken forward, and also what action has been taken to ensure that whenever an appointment is made for the position of Chief Executive of Creative Scotland, that the issues of film and television production are considerably better looked after than perhaps the industry has thought they were in the past. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think what's interesting is that the film industry have uh, provided positive feedback um, on the support to date, but I think she's absolutely correct to identify the importance going forward with the appointment of the new Chief Executive, and that was precisely the discussion I had with Scottish Enterprise last week, to make sure there's good connectivity between the work of Scottish Enterprise in terms of business development for some of the high growth sectors, but also importantly linking to the Indigenous filmmaking industry to make sure we have those links with Creative Scotland as well. Question number nine, Fiona McLeod. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I draw the Chamber's attention to the entry in my Register of Interests as Chair of the Scottish Library and Information Council? To ask the Scottish Government what its plans are for Book Week Scotland 2013 following the successful launch of Book Week Scotland in 2012. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I note the members' particular enthusiasm for, for this project. And Book Week Scotland in 2012 was Scotland's first national celebration of reading, which took place between the 30th of November and the 9th of December 2012. It was a manifesto commitment which was managed by Creative Scotland and delivered by the Scottish Book Trust. Book Week Scotland 2012 raised the profile of books and reading through a wide variety of events and activities for all ages across Scotland, including in public libraries. And plans for Book Week Scotland in 2013 are currently in development and will be announced shortly. Fiona McLeod. Thank you. Can I, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for telling us that the plans are ongoing and can I also take this opportunity to say to the Cabinet Secretary that the Scottish Library and Information Council looks forward to working in partnership to ensure that 2013 is as successful as 2012. Cabinet Secretary. I agree with that and indeed I am very pleased to have the support of the uh, Scottish Library uh, Information uh, Centre. In terms of uh, the reach, uh, we had authors right across Scotland, uh, a real enthusiasm for reading, a real enthusiasm for our literature. I think it is a great way to celebrate um, our literature and our heritage and indeed a great uh, opportunity, particularly on St Andrew's Day, to recognise that rich culture. Question number 10, Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what oh sorry <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government what support it gives to organisations that use drama to raise awareness for social issues. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government believe that culture, particularly the performing arts, can be a powerful way to raise awareness of social issues. That's why in 2012-13, together with Creative Scotland and our national performing companies, we have funded a wide range of projects and organisations which have sought to use the arts to address issues of inequality and intolerance. And this this includes an investment of £116,000 from the Scottish Government to the Citizens' Theatre for the production of The Divided City in the members' constituency. The Divided City is a drama-based exploration of division and exclusion within communities, which looks at issues such as sectarianism and immigration. Uh, the play, which is the product of workshops with young people in the area, was performed in Hamilton in February and was very well received. Christina McKelvey. 
what it was indeed. Can the Cabinet, Se Cabinet Secretary will be aware that I am hosting for the first time ever the live performance outside of Hamilton of the street project tonight in the Garden Lobby at 6 o'clock. The street uses hard-hitting and immersive theatre to teach young people about the potentially serious and dangerous consequences of action that are all too often common in their environments and backgrounds. It's designed to challenge those who dare to take part in a way that has never been done before, using gritty, hard-hitting theatre and top-quality youth work. The street takes theatre and education to a whole new level. Will the Cabinet Secretary join with me in congratulating everyone at the street, especially the young people involved, on the recent COSLA award which they won, and offer whatever support she can to this very worthwhile project? Cabinet Secretary? Uh, I do indeed congratulate them, and I would encourage all members to attend the Parliament, Parliament's premiere of the Divided City. And I think in terms of using arts and culture to address hard-hitting issues and indeed making sure that young people not only can tell their own stories but can reflect on that experience and change people's views and opinions. I think it's an excellent initiative and I would like to provide my congratulations to them as well. Thank you. That ends portfolio questions. We now move on to next.